Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 85th installment of What is Truth? I'm John Barnwell, here in the city of Detroit, Detroit, the Straits, across from Canada, the Queen's Realm. <laughs> I'm not even going to comment on that. Seeing as how it's clear from our research at American Intelligence Media, apparently that's we have that designation uh, under the hood, shall we say. So it's, uh, it's a little uh, sticky wicket, eh what? So here we are with the venerable, <laughs> squeamish Archbishop uh, David William Perry, Reverend Perry in, in merry old England in the city of London and uh, it's just a pleasure to talk to a gentleman that is capable of, of re responding to some of the obscurities that <laughs> seem to float across my radar. And so that's part of the beauty of this conversation is we never know what's gonna pop up because we, we do what we do by ourselves and then we come together and we have a conversation with the understanding that our central theme has to do with what is truth and we're also in the description below that there's a mention of the Grail Mysteries and the work of Russ Steiner, of which we both have a common interest. And uh, <clears throat> well, that gives us a, a basis for conversation, considering it's a massive uh, undertaking if if one takes it seriously, because there's what some five six thousand lectures and fifty books and articles and on and on and on. And then there's the architecture. I mean, if Rudolf Steiner were only to build the first Gertianum and the second Gertianum, he would be considered a marvel just from that standing alone. But it, it never gets mentioned, you know, although Frank Lloyd Wright went all the way to Dornach so he could look at it, you know. And, you know, we have some friend of mine lived in one of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses. Well, it's it's an exploration of what you could do with a straight line. <laughs> and if you look at the doorway to Rudolf Steiner Bookshop in London, uh, you could see that nice uh, anthroposophical style doorway, you know, with these nice curved forms. And so you see that there's this image of morphology. And so when you get into Rudolf Steiner's work, as I've said on many occasions, what you're doing is you're exploring the, the qualities of time. And if you get into other attempts to try and determine with, you know, what is all this? What are we doing here? I mean, you can even go back to Aquinas and say, okay, well, what's he say? You know, he, he even spent time, how many angels could dance on the head of a pin? But you see, in defense of the concept of open sets, he didn't say how big the pin was. <laughs> so that leaves it up to, to the wildest uh, levels of speculation. And so that's kind of the, the, the challenge when you're looking at, uh, like th there was a question here uh, by a gentleman, uh, every notion is supported by a parallel, let me put it on the screen by a parallel quantum biological pneumatology given directly from God. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, pneumatology has to do with the actions of spirit, right? Pneuma is, it's like a pneumatic pump. It, it has to do with the air pump so that, you know, a God breathes life in the man. And that's what it says in the Bible, right? So if you're looking at spiritus, which is the Latin form of, of pneuma, then uh, you get into the whole idea of, the, of spirit. What is spirit? And that becomes a challenge because our relationship to spirit is something that, that undergoes metamorphosis according to the anthroposophical model or the model of spiritual science or Christian occultism which leads back to the school of St. Paul in Athens that was 
headed by Dionysius the Oreopagite, and uh, that whole series of teachers there that took that name, Dionysius. So when you look at the first bishop of Athens, you know, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about Greece and uh, also thinking about its relationship to uh, the Old Testament and the mysteries of, of Jehovah as expressed within the Jewish records, you know, of which is like, I can't tell you how profound my, my uh, humility is before, especially the books of Moses. And so when you get into the, the books of Moses and you get into the, the descriptions, and Rudolf Steiner does a great deal to, to make it clear, there's there's a, a, a division that that is is presented there because you have okay the Jews have their relationship to the Hashem the holy name the the being that appeared to Moses in the burning bush and and the Israelites followed the column of of smoke and and there's experiences in fire but it's it's something that occurred in nature. It was an outside experience. And so understanding the distinction between the mystery of Golgotha, the incarnation of Christ, that there was a change in the relationship to that uh, nature of being, being that if you get into the work of Rudolf Steiner, he, he is very clear it's through the realm of these of Jehovah as the realm of the Elohim, or in Greek, exousiae, that we received our ego, our individual being that makes us a human uh, fourth stage uh, evolution. And so we went through three previous stages, Saturn evolution, sun evolution, a moon evolution, now we're on the earth. And in between, there's what's called in, in the Orient, pralaya, a period of rest for certain levels of beings, okay? And so when you get into understanding that, and then you get into like going back to, to St. Thomas Aquinas, and you get into the whole uh, nexus of efficient cause. In philosophy, they make a big deal out of efficient cause. And, and that gets into like uh, what Blavatsky calls the unmoved mover, you know, it's like, so, well, who created the creator and the whole, this whole chain of linguistics is really what it is because you're attempting to try and put into a, a brain centered alphabetical conceptual set. And the problem is, is when you have a closed set, then you, you end up with the problem like Aquinas probably didn't even ever realize till the day he died. He never said how big the pin was. So that's a closed set. And that he didn't he didn't consider that that was an option. And see, so there's these things that affect us in our lives that we're not aware of. I, I mean, you'll give me that, right? Haven't you ever had a, a mood just come over you? What just happened, you know? And so it, it takes a lot of introspection to be able to look at these things more closely. But I thought we could explore some of that today, but it's a difficult topic. And so what better person to, to wrestle with difficult topics than Reverend David William Perry? David, how are you? My dear friend, it's always good to see you and always good to uh, meet with you on a Sunday afternoon. Um, particularly as my plan to become the, the, the living embodiment of Albert Pike is failing. And my uh, TikTok followers are telling me I look like Ben Franklin, as I was telling you all there. I'm happy with Benjamin Franklin. I'm happy with Benjamin Franklin. Um, so Freemason and founder, well, one of the founding fathers, I'm very happy with it. Um, <clears throat> to defend Fatty Aquinas, um, I think I need to make something. I have I done this on this show before. I need to make clear my theological position in a sense, in the sense that these are my rough folky 
Um, some of some of our little family knows. And by the way, everybody, like and share this show. This is a good show. Please help it develop. You know, we needn't be a small church. We can be a mid-sized church. We can even be a Joel Austin mega church. Who knows? Like and share, please. Um, I mean, I am an initiated Valentinian Gnostic tour, um, as well as being an archbishop within the independent Catholic movement. <clears throat> I, I personally don't see a contradiction with that because the type of Gnosticism I've been discussing for Yonks actually is deeply aligned to Roman Catholicism, Russian and Greek Orthodoxy, so I don't see a, a contradiction. Not all forms of Gnosticism, of course, are in that particular framework, but the ones I'm talking about are in that particular framework. John? Well, I think you could clarify things greatly if, if you could see that... Uh... The word Gnosticism was something that was accusatory. That was something that the people that didn't like them called them. They didn't call themselves that, just so you know, and uh, in, except in very few instances, you know, but, uh, and those being later. So it's, it, it's a question of identif identification and the usage of words. And that's so many things in life have been determined just by the way in which they translated a word. You know, like I, I made the point about uh, the quotation posted below, they, the word Kyrios, they translated Lord, but what does that mean? You know, Kyrios is, that's that divine nature, right? And so it's more than just like a guy who's, uh, has a bunch of tenant farmers, you know. <laughs> Anyways, I, I derailed your, your little uh, missive, and so I'll let you get back to it. Um, I think this show is full of creative derailments. I, 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 that's just good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to say sort of roughly where I'm coming from before I sort of answer the, the questions that you raised. I mean... <sighs> You know, and hesychasm. We didn't we say this last week? You know, on Mount Athos, if ever there was a Gnostic practice, it, it's hesychas hesychastic prayer on Mount Athos. So, you know, what does that mean? I mean, nobody in the mainstream theological, in mainstream theology, has actually said you can't have a deep knowledge of God and you can't have a deep experience of God, which is why I agree with you one hundred percent. You know, Gnostic is one of those accusatory words. It doesn't really mean much. Um, and of course, it does only mean knowledge in Greek. So, you know, whatever. And the mainstream church itself doesn't really. So you can't do those things. It's when a Barney is starting and normally about property or, or money. That's when that floats around. Um, so, you know, I, I've always taken I'm saying that because I've always taken interest in what looks on the outside like a preposterous question. You know, how many angels can you get on the, the end of a pin, no matter how large? Because I always suspect you're looking at something Gnostic uh, when, when you, you get weird questions like that. I mean, I suspect that Aquinas was actually talking about an idea which didn't come back for centuries. Uh, the schoolmen of the Middle Ages were the most annoying group of individuals you'll ever meet. And no, you couldn't take them for supper. They'd bore you to death. But they did raise some interesting issues. Um, one of them possibly being encapsulated in that image. Could there and can there be such a thing as non-spatial being? That is a gigantic question. Um, and only really be beginning to come back now with the advent of things like quantum mechanics, uh, where lots of people are actually asking that question again, but in a much less beautiful form, in a much less beautiful way. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the head of the pin could have been vaster. It could have been the, the minutest thing imaginable because you're dealing with the sort of concept that Aquinas didn't want to be drawn on, but he wanted to show, I think, he was aware of. Um, and so, I mean, you know, both he and Albertus Magnus, magicians as well as monks, which people tend to forget, and the type of Kabbalah, if that's all they were practicing, I suspect they're into a lot more than that. But let, let's stick with that for the time being, the type of Jewish mysticism that was meant to hold back Islam 
um, and the hermeticism that the Muslims of that period were embracing with a gusto. Um, I mean, and is it done in this sort of tribal way, the, the way that moderns do it? Absolutely no, it's not. I mean, there are stories that both Albertus Magnus and Fatih Aquinas address the University of Paris dressed as Arabs, you know, to show their indebtedness to that culture and the advances it was making. You know, I think the tribalism, the tribalism in human affairs tends to be now more than in the past, uh, where, where, you know, the intellectual set, the, the intelligentsia did, actually did have a universalist view in the best of senses without denigrating their own tradition. That, that's something that's been lost. Uh, maybe that needs to come back. And certainly, as I say, quantum mechanics, quantum biology, since that's already been raised. Um, I mean, those are questions, you know, what would non-spatial being entail? What on earth could it be? And theoretically, there's no reason why it cannot be. Um, you know, you're looking at vast and, and important questions that do have direct bearing on our lives, though as surprising as that seems, uh, whether we like it or not. I was thinking uh, during the week, curiously, of the so-called new high priesthood, uh, you know, the, the astronomers, um, astrophysicists. I mean, let's face it, we're all on our knees to them nowadays. Hubble telescopes, you know, uh, photographs from the edge of the universe. And it's great. I'm not knocking it. It's absolutely great. Um, but we do have to remember that that they themselves grudgingly admit to something the sociologists don't admit. The social sciences, you know, that's like your local vicar. That's like sort of your local clergy that want to, you know, don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. You know, they, they want to stifle questions. Whereas, whereas <laughs> I thought you'd like that metaphor. Yeah, well, yeah, they're kind of like Frankus, right? You know, they don't want to tell you how to think. They want to tell you what to think, right? And what people don't understand, you know, they hear about St. Thomas Aquinas. It's really no big deal to them. But if you did an analysis of conversations that they'd have had, let's say, the last five, ten years, uh, you won't find anything within uh, your language idiom that wasn't formatted, so to speak, by Thomas Aquinas. So you are indebted to him every day, right? That's the, the whole orientation of your relationship to language and thinking and all of that is an inheritance from Thomas Aquinas who took the ideas of Aristotle and, and oriented them to Christology. In addition to the, the second most quoted source next to him in the Bible, is the writings attributed to Dionysius, the first bishop of Athens, which is like the rudder on this show, because that's that whole idea of spiritual beings. Angels, archangels, archai, uh, exousiae, deutemes, curiotides, thrones, uh, cherubim, seraphim, that, that whole series, that divine series that's expressed in the Kabbalahs, the tree of life, that it's these, uh, the planetary, spheres of activity and that we live within this this relationship to the cosmos that's very much oriented to time and going back to what i had said about the mysteries having to do with the resurrection and then leading to pentecost is that that Rudolf steiner says that jesus christ the mystery of Golgotha brought time back to mankind and that they were in danger of just becoming space beings. There was no, you know, time, well, that doesn't really mean anything. This is a long time ago. They were just like me. And now we have different information because we worked at it longer. And that whole prosaic argument that doesn't hold water, even if, if you do a short analysis like uh, Owen Barfield, I mean, he discovered the evolution of consciousness by studying linguistics and realized that the whole context of language goes through this whole metamorphosis, which has to be representative of the consciousness that's using it. See, so you have this here, and, and, and I guess what I wanted to throw in is people working with these closed-set philosophical models 
are, are you taking that into consideration? I'm not sure Reverend David does. Do I take those things into consideration? I'll have to think about that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, let's, let's sort of round that, that off with saying, of course, Aquinas did have a Gnostic experience at the end of his life, a deep mystical experience, which he didn't really want to talk about much, which is interesting, under the pretext that it couldn't be talked about much, which actually puts it in line with the religious experience of mankind, of humankind, forgive me. Um, you know, when, when one starts to approach the ineffable, um, and everything I quote was simply straw in the fire compared yeah. to that. There you go. You know, so, but I don't know, I'm, I'm less pessimistic maybe than the great mystics. Of course, not being there myself, who knows? One day maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the great sources of enlightenment for me is, of course, the officially atheist Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, and I've made the gag on the show so many times, but I'll do it again. You know, the most religious atheist in history, John. <laughs> okay, well, you have to you have to finish that because calling Wittgenstein atheist is just like it makes your head explode. I mean, because at the end of his life, people would ask him what he was doing. He's he was, and I have to paraphrase, but he said he's trying to make it so that there's more Christ than him. You know, so. What does that mean, you know? And I wish I could pull up the exact quote, but I mean, you get the smartest people, and what do they do? They pursue the divine. Oh, yeah. I mean, certainly he would have self-identified as an atheist. Of course, when you're dealing with a man that sophisticated, all of a sudden you're not dealing with linguistic certainties. I mean, he used to terrify his students that used to meet yeah, they used to sit in deck chairs around him holding forth in his in his room, which had become a lecture theatre. And, and when he'd say things like each day, you know, what would it mean if a man really meant that each day he must become less and Christ must become more and terrify them with these, these wonderful thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, curiously, I've always found a great benefit from the tension between those polar opposites. Um, what I don't want to do in the case of Wittgenstein or indeed Samuel Beckett um, is suddenly say they were theists underneath. Oh, come on, they were, weren't they? Um, because all of a sudden that's putting them back into a very easy category. Probably most of them would have been uneasy with. And all of a sudden the level of grating insight between those two poles of language, if we're following the theme of today, and experience all of a sudden is lost. You know, we've lost the thesis and antithesis, therefore we'll never get to the synthesis. I mean, waiting for Godot, Samuel Beckett, I find him an incredibly religious atheist. Um, I don't find that a trivial play in the least. It's saturated with religious imagery. Um, and who exactly are the vagrants? What is it exactly they're waiting for? And why have they chosen that way of passing their time? You know, John. Come on, Samuel Beckett. I mean, he's a he's like a, that's like a Zen co koan. You know, he's a he's like a, a Western Zen guy. This is the way I always I took that. Oh, fully agreed. But again, we mustn't lessen the tension in those things. You know, so we live in a godless universe, sort of, but these things are still meaningful. That's an incredible tension. I mean, I I was unusual, I think, as as, as archbishops go. Do you know, I hate that title. Um, because I, not completely uh, for my first degree, although I confess during my first degree, you know, when I was world-weary, uh, um, sort of um, late student, uh, because in those days, in, you know, there was a political impulse in this country until recently, until the last couple of years, that as many people that went to university as can should go. Um, I was sort of caught up in the, the early stages of that, you know, mature students is what they used to call them. And it was a, in those days, it was a real thing here. Are you going to go to university or not? And if you are, why? But, you know, what, what benefits? I mean, I eventually thought, yes, because I'd made an agreement 
with my dear friend Richard Rushley, the anthropologist, to see if we could bear it. You know, all, all these people putting themselves in positions of knowledge that they may or may not, they may or may not be able to justify. Um, and I was thinking um, a formal ministry. Therefore, it seemed like an appropriate thing to do. God knows what he was thinking of, but I was thinking of a, a ministry. Um, so I started reading the existentialists then. Uh, I dib dabbled with them before that. I certainly read them if pleasure is the right word. I've read them very deeply for pleasure uh, since that time. I mean, Miguel de Unamuno, the, the sort of, um, I'm terrible, sorry, my frang, my Spanglish isn't that good, sorry. John. Yeah, when you consider most people uh, are more inclined to read comic books or romance novels, and here you for just for kicks are reading existential philosophers, is to me hilarious. I mean, I, I I read those things as well, but not as often. Um, and that you can get it. There's a charge. There, there's an excitement in reading those things too. I mean, I was in reading uh, Miguel. Oh, no, I can't say it right, Miguel. Um, I think, wasn't that the story of the priest who's losing his faith? And it was an incredibly upsetting and disturbing piece that I came out of thinking, my God, I'm so pleased I read that. You know, that has really taught me a, a huge amount about the assumptions people have regarding their faith and the assumptions they have about religion generally. And as that, you know, at the back of that play, at the back of that story, there's a question that he never denied was there. Okay, so what is religion? And that you don't get in all these endless, what is it, all this, all this stuff that, that the sort of a Joel Austin keeps producing, even my hero, T.D. Jakes, you know, you're okay by me. You know, we're all in this together. It's just garbage at the end of the day. Would it save anybody's life? Would it make the world a better place? No. I mean, it makes everybody chuffed. I hope that's a, a word a word that travels the Atlantic. You know, we can all pat each other on the back. You're great. Well, so are you. You know, but it's not Christianity. Uh, it's not anything to do with the mysteries. And I think you have to go through... I mean, is it even questioning? Do you know not once did it make me think, is there a God or not? It made me think, what do I mean by that assumption? What do I mean by that in, inner experience, by the inner knowledge, by that intuitive source, grasp? It made me think that. What on earth do I mean by that? But it never made me think, well, no, you know, d d barking up the wrong tree. This is This is all bollocks. It never made me think that. If anything, it deepened my understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to question, and what on earth could the Gnostics have meant? And there are some very big minds in church history that have fallen at this hurdle. You know, what would phrases like the God beyond God actually mean? Um, and, you know, the witch, whole witch trials have started for no reason apart from the fact certain ecclesiastical authorities didn't like that question. But that is a good question for the simple reason, like how many angels can stand on the edge of a pin, on the end of a pin, for one simple reason. It throws the ball back into your core. What do you mean by God? If there's something called God, what do you mean by God? Is there something beyond God? Well, you know, what do you mean by that term in the first place? In Wittgenstein's I don't know. I, th I think the logic, uh, as I say, that he wrote two masterpieces, the Tractatus. Uh, no one doubts uh, it's a masterpiece. You must be you must know nothing about linguistics if you can't see how that's a trailblazing work of genius. But uh, people f don't want to get into the riddles posed by the philosophical investigation, which is the second work of genius and tantamount to something scriptural for me, uh, because, you know, he even thinks attributing too many frameworks to words like existence is on the verge of being sacrilegious. And all of a sudden you think, oh, my God. So he never he never denies goodness, beauty and truth. He just doesn't think we know what we're talking about when we're using those terms. 
without saying that there is no goodness, beauty and truth, which is what the lesser lights in linguistics and the lesser lights in popular philosophy nowadays are trying to say. Oh, what he meant was, no, it's all very clear. Read the text. You're not reading the text. You're reading secondary sources. You're reading articles in journals. You're not reading the text. Um, you know, the, what was it? The fact that the world exists is the mystery. It's not a pointer to the mystery. That is the mystery. And we've got to, you know, remember to be caught in these in this terrible, terrible hinterland, this terrible no man's land between what the existentialists are trying to write about and what people of faith are trying to write about. You know, because there, there isn't this chasm between the two, it's, which is, is so often assumed nowadays. And the greatest existentialist, I mean, I like Jean-Paul Sartre. I mean, I find his speculations on religious questions patronising. Um, and I don't find them that really informed. Sorry, Jean-Paul. Love you, darling. You know, you'll survive as a playwright. You'll survive as a, uh, you'll survive as a director. You won't survive as a philosopher. I mean, he sent a copy of what was it being a nothing nothingness to Heidegger, who called it Dreck in German. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, I'm not translating. Come and look it up. Um, so, so you know, so the French version. What well, Heidegger was rude, but he could be rude. You know, that's what a, a French Cartesian thinks of being a timeline. You know, yeah, bash, bash, um, and probably deserved. You know, because Heidegger circles these questions in a sense, you know, that he wants to answer them, but won't. And I think that in, in itself is important. Where, whereas someone like Jean-Paul thinks he's arrived at a conclusion. You must be joking, mate. Yeah. Um, and that someone like Wittgenstein teases, he teases responses. Um, obviously in philosophy, that's the best name for me, but I think in terms of drama, um, as I say, you know, we're looking again at Samuel Beckett and those wondrous Zen, I agree, 100 percent Zen like writings about what is it? What is it all? Where is it taking us? Um, and it always seems to lead back to this sort of mystery of mysteries, which for me is the Christian tradition. Handing back to you, John, because you're looking concerned. No, it's not a matter of concern. I was looking and I had to you reminded me of something I was Considering earlier, and uh, if you get into uh, the history of all things British and their relationship to uh, philosophy and the influence of the Kabbalah on uh, British philosophy, of which most people are almost totally unaware, that uh, it played such a, a huge role in, in the evaluation of scripture and all of that and you get into interesting individuals like Cudworth and 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 the translations into Latin because a lot of sources that were being used were in Latin and of course you're talking about scholars here British scholars that could read both Latin and Greek or they got hit with a ruler <laughs> and so they have a capability of yeah yeah, he remembers. But <laughs> and so in looking at that, and like somebody like Ann Conway, for example, a beautiful example of she was a Viscountess Conway. Her, her uh, maiden name was Finch, but she's an English philosopher, and she's within the tradition of the Cambridge Platonists, and she influenced Gottfried Leibniz, and Leibniz is like huge. I mean. <laughs> Leibniz, uh, you know, it, it be, it's still a bone of contention uh, whether uh, calculus should be rightfully attributed to Isaac Newton or, or Leibniz, okay? and Because they were corresponding at the time re regarding the outer limits of mathematism and what, and, uh, but Rudolf Steiner did comment on that. And he said, well, if you take Leibniz's approach to the matter is more healthy than Newton's, you know, because Newton's basically, well, you just take the circle that you're trying to circumscribe and just however many slices you cut the pie, that's how you get your calculation. So that's that's the uh, oversimplification, but it has to do with 
it does make a difference how you got to what you uh, came as as a how you understand things, and that's that's the rub. It's like when you get into like health issues, and they say there are they want to find like some microorganism that's responsible for certain things happening. It never crosses their mind that well maybe that microorganism is present because something happened. But see, they're not going to get paid coming up with that as an answer, so they don't look for that. Even though uh, they may find it, they don't think about it that way. They go on and go, okay, so what could we do to combat this microorganism? Rather than, well, why did the system become imbalanced? Perhaps uh, more often than not, it's just a merely acid-alkaline imbalance within the lymphatic system that leads to most conditions, and they're that's which is what they should be called. But until they call it a, a dis-ease, uh, they can't get paid for it, really. So there you have the, the, the uh, thievery of language again. It's this whole, it, it gets back to linguistics, and linguistics is tied into all the, the mind control mimetics and the whole, the whole scam that, that gets run on people through uh, government by journalism and and this the fake media and and it's like a branch of your uh, intelligence headquarters and so you, it's like uh, what use is it to to quote Pravda you know I I, I never do you know because wh what are they doing while well, they're trying to promote how not how to think but they're trying to tell you what to think and so. You'll never get very far in science with that uh, approach, and and so I derailed once again where you were going with that. But you handed off to me because I was looking around. Oh, I remember. Yes, Anne Conway. What a wonderful soul she is. Let me see. I have something over here. What one of her uh, associates is, is uh, one of my f uh, favorite characters in in that whole culture. Francis Mercury Van Helmont, okay? So obviously Van Helmont, well, he's, his father uh, is uh, important in the history of science, and, and but this is by Alison Couder, and it's a nice edition that I got many years ago. E.J. Brill, a wonderful publisher out of the Netherlands. But uh, Impact of the Kabbalah in the 17th Century, the Life and Thought of Francis Mercurius Van Helmont. And so when you look at that and you see that that's what they were using, they were using Kabbalistic uh, kind of mathematism and the whole idea of this Neoplatonic uh, understanding or apocalypticism really is what it is if you get into scripture because it's about the number. And when they start giving things numbers in scripture, you know, there's something important going on here, by the way, you know, that. It's why is it always twelves and sevens and so there's there's something very significant going on uh, beneath the surface, so to speak, when you get into the permutations and you get into the the uh, text Nur von Rosenross uh, that was translated uh, out of the Latin uh, by uh, Samuel uh, Liddell McGregor Mathers the head of the Order of the Golden Dawn, which is a hermetic uh, Kabbalistic society that Charles Williams, who was an inkling, he belonged to one of the Golden Dawn type societies. And so it's using hermetic and alchemical and Kabbalistic methods of speculation. And that's, that's very much in, in the tradition of the Neoplatonic stream and, and uh, the Viscountess uh, Conway, who's just a wonderful, brilliant soul. Unfortunately, she was plagued by migraine headaches, and they couldn't figure anything out. They even tried bleeding her in her jugular veins to relieve pressure in her brain. She tried everything, and she had died at an early age. But she was a brilliant writer, is still talked about. And so I love finding these really key uh, females like Jane Lead or all these interesting characters, uh, you know, Countess Wachmeister who helped Madame Blavatsky. She's an interesting character indeed. And so, but when we get into some of this, 
I want to go back to where I found it and I put it somewhere. I'm always finding things and putting them somewhere. Here's a nice quote from somebody out of that tradition of the Golden Dawn. It's uh, this Mark Hetzel wrote a very interesting book I read years ago. It was published back in 1998. And uh, it's called The Zealotor, which is a degree in the Golden Dawn system. But the title is The Zealotor, A Modern Initiate Explores the Ancient Mysteries. And in there he says, the sleepers are those who have not elected to follow a spiritual path. They are content with the realm of appearances and want only to be left alone, to sleep. You're up. Was that me falling asleep? Um, yeah. uh, oh, you said loads of things. I mean, yeah, I, I uh, uh, haven't read that particular aristocrat deeply. I've come a, across her work. Uh, I must do that one day. She sounds fascinating. I mean, also, it's good to remember that Platonism runs through traditional British thinking, uh, British academia, very, 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 very deeply. Um, and I would argue more deeply than Kabbalistic thought, although I take your point. Kabbalistic thought is everywhere the minute you begin to look at it. But Platonism from the start, I mean, certainly uh, I bumped into Lady Warnock, uh, who only died recently, of course, a couple of times. It was with, listen, bitch, you're a Platonist, yeah. You're a Platonist. Never answered me. Never answered me. But right, you're a Platonist, yeah. Um, I did meet a couple of times uh, Iris Murdoch and her remarkable partner, John Bailey. Um, I don't know. Iris still rings in my ears. I mean, an open Platonist, um, which is something surprising. I mean, how did she manage to keep her position in Oxford when she was openly Platonist? But she'd say it. She'd say it unlike these other people. Yes, she was. Because, you know, uh, three essays in philosophy, I can't remember, it came out as a booklet, it's in the connected works nowadays, well, you know, what would it mean to be a modern Platonist, um, her defence of the notion of the good, um, which is an extraordinary piece of work, uh, so it's still there, I mean, going back to people, you know, I, I mean, yes, yeah, as far as I know, the answer to that one is yes, yeah. Um, because it held the blood of Christ. So in some way, it was identified with the being of Christ, as far as I understand that. Uh, Powers, as anyone that follows the show knows, obsesses me. I'm the new John Cooper Powers. It's me, okay? Um, I perhaps I just, should read the quote so that people who heard... Oh, sorry, I, I, I never know who can see things or not. A question to Rev David, didn't Powers believe the Grail was an object that slipped into this world from another world and was similar to Christ uh, in in that it, in that way. So the answer is, from my view, yes, because somehow it was identified because it was the cup of Christ, the, the cup that held the blood of Christ with the being of Christ. Therefore, it was somehow it somehow became part of his. Part of the whole way that that consciousness, that energy interacts with us, um, you know, like like a, a, a small glass of something, which is that something. I mean, don't forget, that's the idea behind the Eucharist, whether you take sort of the traditional Roman Catholic view, transubstantiation or not. You know, does it literally become, does the wine and the bread literally become flesh and blood? People like me would have trouble, including Aquinas, by the way. With what do you mean by the word literally? You know, I mean, does it become flesh and blood? Well, yes, no, yes, no. You know, I mean, I've always found Luther um, much more helpful in the sense that Luther, Martin Luther would never have de denied that the real presence, the energy of Christ was there at the communion table. He'd never have denied that. Um, it was really reformers like Zwingli who say it's a, memorial meal uh, and it's it's not anything else but uh, you know there, there's a whole tradition where it right what is christ he's the historical teacher jesus he's bread he's wine he's the grail he's you know, a number of things at the same time that beckon us to this greater form of being through him 
you know, the idea in communion is that you're participating in a meal of God's stuff. You imbibe it and it somehow starts a chain reaction within you uh, and it makes you divine. Yeah. Yes, John. Yeah, it's that whole concept of uh, the convergence of the imminent and the transcendent. Can the imminent and transcendent simultaneously exist without you just slipping into like pantheism, right? And so when you get into understanding it from the, the tradition of the Grail legends and where you have uh, the trails, what Al Albert von Scharfenberg, I believe it was, who described the Grail as the stone that fell from the crown of Lucifer. Okay, so that there's this whole idea that there's something that was already here is undergoing a change as a result of the deed of Christ, the blood coming from Christ into this emerald chalice in the symbolical language. And of course that emerald chalice in a way you could see is earth. Earth is like an emerald chalice. It's a chalice full of souls. Uh, we can look at it that way. but. If you take this, and, and there, you can go with it layers and layers, and that's why Rudolf Steiner was, was, although he was a scientist, it's you look to his artistic work as being a real uh, free and clear path to awakening until you're capable of dealing with the concepts, right? You can paint watercolors or make dolls or uh, do you with me? There's all these various artistic forms because they leave you free. They don't say, this is the way you've got to do it. They're not telling you what to do. They're showing you how to do something. And that that's there's such a difference uh, that way early in our podcast, I used to tease David about the difference between shall and must. And there's a world of difference. You know, so it, it does make a difference what one word means. And, but when you get into this, and, and I guess we're getting closer to some of the things that I've been thinking about lately, but well, okay, so what is the nature of the transition to where Paul uh, became the bridge into the Greek speaking world so that, that uh, the mysteries of Christianity wasn't just like a subcult of Judaism, but that it was a world mystery. And so that whole idea of the grail is being that which is waiting to receive something. And so you can look at traditions like Kabbalah means tradition. So it's, it's a receptacle for, for ideation. It's a receptacle for thinking, just like mathematics is. You can take mathematics and use it as a structure in which you can think about things. That's the whole point of mathematism is to be able to to use it as a language of, of the relationship between space but also time and they always leave out that time element but it's it has an objective existence according to steiner and if you get into like uh, for example e equals mc squared and what steiner said about that you know is like the, the real thing is the velocity you know the the all these other things that they're coming up with, those are the illusions that are a result of the way in which they're approaching it. But that, that it's the velocity that's the thing that's real because that's that will force, right? That's, that's where the arising comes from. And so, for example, let's trace back to the, uh, the Old Testament and Jehovah Elohim, the exousiae being. So do, like, what, is, what does Steiner say about the exousiae? Well, we received our ego from them. But there's an important point to keep in mind is that it's their responsibility for Earth evolution, and they will be the gatekeepers for the next stage uh, what, to, to, that determines whether or not you succeeded at becoming a human that was capable of graduating to the, the next uh, stage of being an angeloi in, in the Jupiter evolution. So obviously you've got that whole idea of that there is a, a gatekeeper there and it's the father principle and that that's really the, the the criteria that you have to be able to meet to be able to graduate 
Okay, so let's say, well, what about this Luciferic thing? What is that? Well, the Old Testament Jehovah impulse is unaffected by that Luciferic impulse. It's a pure uh, Jehovah stream. So it's tying into that rea reality basis of which the word came to expression in the, the burning bush mystery that, that was revealed to Moses. And so it's unaffected by all this pagan stuff. And yet the Greek, it's the Greek element that brings in that pagan element. And that's that Luciferic thing. Because if you get in studying Greeks, I mean, it's fascinating because if you get into the mythology of the Greek gods, I mean, geez, they're, they're a, a piece of work, aren't they? And, and Rudolf Steiner does indicate in, in this particular lecture cycle, Wonders of the World, Ordeals of the Soul, Revelations of the Spirit, that he, he gave in uh, Munich back in 1911, August to 18th to the 27th. And he gets into explaining this distinction. It's, it, that's what I've been like spending most of my time in my studies with over the last few weeks, because if you don't know that, do you, have you really figured out what Rudolf Steiner is trying to say? Because in there, he, he talks about the beings in, in the early stages of mankind, that, that there were these beings that, that uh, are abnormal angels from old moon that preceded Earth evolution. They didn't graduate. So they can incarnate into human bodies in the early stages of our evolution. The angels that actually graduated from old moon, they can't do that. They can overshadow somebody, but they would be violating their mission were they to just come and, and, and take human form at this stage right now. So <laughs> it, it becomes fascinating and complex when you start to see that this there's this whole uh, distinction between the upper gods and the lower gods, and that which is arising from the earth and that which arises from the heavens. And it's such a complex subject. I mean, I was discussing it earlier with my good friend uh, and anthroposophist, uh, Joe, you know, and so like Joe uh, Visconti, he's like, Intrigued by some of the similar things that I'm intrigued by because he's been dealing with it most of his life, although he's considerably younger than I am, so he doesn't creak as much when he talks about it. And 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 so it becomes a question of what is that distinction? So what happened? And 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 it's interesting because Rito Steiner talks about how at the end of Atlantis, some you know, 10, 15,000 BC, you know, that the, the old Indian period <clears throat> began, and that was guided by the realm of the Archai, and then the old Persian period, guided by the realms of the Archangels, and then you come to the Egyptian period, and it's guarded by the, angel, by the realm of the angels. And then we go into the Greek period, and the hierarchy stepped back and let man go ahead and like just try to be a guy without all kinds of uh, uh, interference, shall we say. And so something new arises as a result of this because you have that, that impulse of Dionysos, you know, and, they, and, and Rudolf Steiner talks about how Dionysos traveled all over and he was, he was uh, breeding cultural development. He said he even went as far as India. And so it becomes interesting because then you look at some of the early uh, uprisings because that's the way cultures tend to to, they bud. They, all of a sudden, there's nothing going on here. And all of a sudden, boom, all this stuff starts happening. Why Why all of a sudden? Well, if you get into the history of, of occultism and spiritual science, and Blavatsky talks about it, Steiner talks about it, on and on and on, is that leaders of mankind come and, and you know, and, and you look in their traditions, and that's what they say, by the way. If you look in, uh, in the ancient cultures as much as I have, and I've done, you know, 15,000 volume database on ancient cultures. And, and, you, and I've looked over all this stuff and they all concur. They agree. Yeah, this guy came along 
and he showed us how to do language and agriculture. It goes on and on and on. You get into like, say, for example, the Hermetic writings uh, that were nice addition by GRS Mead. I forgot I had this. I was digging around and I pulled out a box and I opened it up and had all kinds of goodies in there. And I thought, oh my, you know, I did. But in the Hermetic writings, you get in there and you get into these sermons that are really, it's from the Greco-Roman period, but it's, it's still, it has to do with the, the reality of this presence that is a result of interaction with beings of the spiritual world. And that's, it's, it's inconceivable uh, to, to think of somebody from the ancient world who didn't think that there were spiritual beings on the other side, even though they may not be able to see them anymore, they still acknowledged it. Um, yeah, at this point, I'd like to remind everybody that we're holding a Nephilim Anthropology Conference in person and online where such things will be discussed by a glittering international panel of experts. Um, Nephilim, of course, is only one way of addressing these types of being. Uh, giants and demigods and so on, those are other ways of addressing them. Um, and I, I hope maybe you contact me directly or John if you want to know more about that. Um, I'm rather like pantheism. Um, I think you can actually have a Christian pantheism, but that's another question. Um, uh, what was I talking about before we got to the blood, the, the cup of the Holy Grail? Oh yeah, um, Platonism. Um, certainly. Um, the Grail. I like, so oh yeah, again, the Grail. The Grail. Well, I mean, the Grail is you know, I. I suspect there's more to the arts and the artistic involvement in these fields than simply a suspension of analysis. Um, I'm bitterly suspicious of any church. Universities are there to discuss stuff. That's their job. I'm deeply suspicious. You are an abandoned angel, but you're not abandoned. You're an angel, no. but you're not abandoned. Um, no, it says abnormal. Oh, did it say abnormal? Um, yeah. or abnormal, whatever. Um, a, that's those that's those cognitive filters again. See, <laughs> um, no, it's probably these glasses, and it comes up in a weird small way at the bottom of my screen. Isn't that a cognitive filter, though? Um, it would be if I could see see it, John. You've got to remember, I can't see any of these messages, and there's this very thin sort of ticker tape thing that it appears in on my screen. I don't think anyone that watches this show is abnormal. Um, um, I think that we're all questing. I regard us as community. I think you all know that. A church uh, that are simply uh, people involved in a, in, a, in a weekly show. I think there's a lot more going on than that. Um, right, let me finish the other point, then I'll get back to this one. Certainly Platonism goes through two of my own heroes, William Temple, who, of course, was a mere Anglican, um, and William Law, who was also a mere Anglican. Um People want to see why Platonism is so important, even nowadays. Look at William Temple and look at William Law, because, you know, what was it? A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law is a masterpiece of spiritual direction. I used to have a first edition of that. I hate you, John. I hate, I've never had anything like a first edition of anything. Oh, it's long, you. long gone. I oh, no, 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 don't start that. The, uh, impecunity has made me sell many a treasure, so let's not go down that. And also, no no creaky remarks. I feel so creaky today, it's untrue. <laughs> um, I, I made the mistake uh, of trying to get some exercise over the last couple of days. I walked to the end of a park and back, and now I feel that I've no limbs left that can actually do anything. But anyway, that's an aside. Um, Don't forget William Ralph Inge. Oh, yeah. Do you know, I was going to write a play on the gloomy Dean at one point. He was also a nudist, an early British nudist. <laughs> and what they used to say at his college was, what a miserable bugger. And I thought, how, how, yeah, practicing mystic and mis miserable bugger, how can I put that onto the stage, darling? But I, no one encouraged me, so it's on the back burner somewhere. You never know one day. You know, I like Ralph. Ralph in John like Ralph in. Um, <laughs> His book on Christian mysticism is really very good. 
Yeah, but it's brilliant. But you know, was it was he laid and on the bed? By and sat on Plotinus. It, I mean, it's wonderful stuff. Yeah, yeah, but but was he laying on the beach being depressed? Was he laying nude on the beach being depressed? And that's the image I could never get out of my mind. Yeah, so why are you depressed? You can't, you can't unsee that. <laughs> um, and, oh, God, oh, God, this shit. Right, hang on. Um, blah, blah, blah. Greek gods, um, <clears throat> probably not worthy of the term theos um, in the sense that we use it nowadays. Uh, they were, as you said, beings. I mean, I quite know. I mean, the Olympians, you know, they love going around looking cool. Most people get them wrong nowadays. It was a closed shop, John. But the, the key point that, that uh, one of the key points, because there's never only one, but uh, uh, an important point that Rudolf Steiner makes about the, the Greek mythologies, he says basically, and I paraphrase, if you notice, they're not really particularly concerned with the development of mankind. They're busy with their own situation, their own drama and their interaction with each other. You're not, it's not about, you know, them giving mandates, mankind, thou shalt do this and don't do that. So it's it's not that, it's not that uh, Old Testament uh, God as the ruling impulse thing. It's like these, these are beings that they have their own agenda. They're off doing other stuff. And hey, if they get into a uh, some kind of mishap with a mortal, well, too bad for them. You know, it's it's like it's kind of like they they're they're uh, they don't hardly look askance on on mankind, and that makes it so interesting. And and that's actually the source of drama. Drama c comes out of that whole milieu of of that that uh, Greco-Roman mythos. And so you have this, 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 these impulses, these cultural impulses, and the Dionysic uh, impulses, and then you have uh, Silenus, you know, the, the the old teacher of uh, Dionysius. So you have, and you have the, the the elder Dionysius, Dionysius Zagreus, and then you have Dionysius the younger, and Dionysius the younger is that actual being, Rudolf Steiner says, that went and spread cultural impulses to other cultures and that he reincarnated as Plato, okay? And Silenus as Socrates. So, you know, I, I don't, uh, on many occasions, as you'll know, mention uh, things that Rudolf Steiner said about reincarnation, who's who kind of thing. But this is one little page in that body of work that that most anthroposophists haven't even seen because this is like this is a, a pretty obscure volume and it was translated uh it was translated by uh dorothy len but she was assisted by owen barfield so it's 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 interesting in that regard and and the original edition was done back in the 40s so you know it's a possibility that some of the inklings beyond Owen Barfield were aware of this actual translation. And so it really probably put them through some challenge, you know? And so you have to look at, at, at these things as influences that may be present, they may be not, you don't know. Like saying about, about uh, Wittgenstein, is he, was he, what's his relationship to deism and this and the, well, you'd have to speculate because you don't know because he didn't say. And so that there's so much radical assumption in the way people think about things. And I just want to try and help people. If you're going to pursue truth, hey, let, try working with an open set because there's a ton of stuff you, you don't know. I know there's every day I'm finding out stuff I didn't know. And so it keeps broadening your capacity to be able to look at a situation from many vantage points. And that, that brings to mind a, a quote I wanted to, before we run out of tea, time here, uh, I'm, I wanna get to this quotation that I put uh, below, and you can read it below, but I'm gonna read it here. And this is from uh, that lecture, Kyrios, the Lord of the Soul. It's lecture 11 in the background of the Gospel of St. Mark. It was given in Munich on December 12th of 1910. And that's collected works 124. 
But he says, Rudolf Steiner says, we have understood that the reason why there are four Gospels <clears throat> is that their authors, writing as inspired occultists, each wish to describe the great event from a special angle. Just as a photograph of an object is taken from a particular side. By combining the pictures, each taken from a different angle, an idea of the reality can be obtained. Each of the evangelists makes it possible for us to study one aspect in particular of the great event in Palestine. Now, I read this to you recently, and so I'm not going to read the whole quotation, but I'm, I'm you know, reminding you of that particular uh, quotation, and it's listed below, along with all the other information. But so you you have this whole idea that there's this dynamic relationship to, to what's called in the Christian tradition the tetramorph, and and the tetramorph is that image you see where you have the the gospels represented with the the beings. Uh, you'll see them on cathedrals, you know, so you have the Gospel of Matthew is like an angel, perhaps holding a book. It's like a man type figure. And then you go the Gospel of Luke is a bull that represents Taurus, just as the angel was Aquarius. And then uh, the Gospel of Mark is the lion, which is the Leo. And then you have the Scorpio, which is the higher symbol of that is an eagle, and that's the Gospel of John. Or you can have that uh, stinger. The, the the underbelly of of that mystery is that that scorpion thing. So you see that there's this uh, dynamic, what they call a tetramorph. I mean, tetra is four, you know. So there's that's the morphology of the Gospels that Rudolf Steiner is referring to, and. So you get into this and working with images like that, that's the artistic path. And so you see that. And because remember, in the Middle Ages, people on Sundays would go and they'd go to the cathedral and, and they would see these images, okay? And then they would go in and they would hear uh, a mass in a language they didn't know and they would sing songs and you know maybe over time they would pick up the meaning of the lyrics they'd ask somebody or something of that nature so you have to have to kind of put your thinking cap and and think about who are these people and what is their relationship to this particular mystery and you see that the the, the central theme that they're being presented with it's artistic Okay, a cathedral and the whole ritual of the mass uh, leading up to the experience of the Eucharist and, and the consecration of the host in the wine, that, that, that's, that's an artistic mystery. And then you, the, you could struggle with the concept of that God is not just a scientist, he's an artist. And, and an artist, when an artist starts, he doesn't know what the final picture is going to look like exactly. And so when we've been giving Earth evolution to be able to develop as human beings, does God or the beings that created us, the, the exousiae, do they know how it's all going to work out? I mean, then you get into Calvinism and all that, well, it's all preordained, so it doesn't make any difference. What you do, you're going to end up where you end up. And so you, you struggle with that whole idea of your intellectual framework. And it, when you get into the heart mystery, then it becomes more of an expression of that still small voice that's mentioned in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Love. And so you have that uh, inkling that Christ, as the Kyrios, as the Lord, wishes for us to find fulfillment through that Christ mystery. And that's the, the idea behind uh, the Lord's Prayer, the only prayer that he gave us. And I, I'll recount the story because I haven't told it in a long time. Is, uh, you know, I used to go uh, to Christian community masses and, and I'd go there and the service, uh, always in the back, there'd be this bus that would show up from, from the Camp Hill where they would have the mentally challenged children and all that. And they'd be in the back 
of the room during the service, and they'd be like moving around and fidgeting and doing all this until the consecration of man, until the, the, the mystery of the blessing, uh, the bread and wine, that, that consecration uh, that's in within the concept of the Christian community isn't just uh, in memory of, uh, you know, uh, that it is, a, is an actual mystery. And the example of that is that when the, the mass would come to that culmination of the Eucharist, that they'd all go quiet and they would reverently stare at the Eucharist. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. So what's going on there? Why is it all all through the, the service, they're all like moving around and fidgeting and doing anything but paying attention until it comes to the mystery of the Eucharist. And then they're all sitting in reverent attention. I mean, that to me is something that's not a nothing. And and so, I you know, I would challenge somebody who's, who's an atheist to give me an explanation of what just happened. Um, gosh, yeah, I mean, I suppose, to, to finish my point from earlier, what worries me is the desanguination of the mysteries, the devitalization of the mysteries, you know. Um, churches now are going through the work of social workers, uh, and we all turn up and we have a nice time, hopefully, uh, and we all meet the gossipy wife of the vicar afterwards. Um, you know, I mean, but is anyone really facing the mystery? Uh, churches love formulas and dogmas and doctrines and all that's important and all of it's good. But as I was saying earlier, if words in the head is all that's happening, then there's no consciousness, there's no subconsciousness, there's no creative involvement with these concepts, with these realities. And that's why I think the artistic approach is superior. Um, it's not that it's suspending something. You're involving, you're engaging with these realities in a different way. I mean, you know, take baptism as an example. I've, I've heard certain people, ministers, uh, shame on us all in the Bible Belt that want to talk about baptism as your entry into the church. That's not what it means. Uh, baptism starts your journey of divinization. That's the original idea where you become as a god. Now, we can argue about what the ancients meant by that, but that is what they say is going to happen. Um, you're raised to the level of the angels at the least. Uh, you know, as our good Lord himself said, ye shall be as gods. Um, and we can argue about what that, what that means and what that may mean, but the point is it was said. Um, and to go along, although that's not been said, and that's really not what he meant, you know, are you a full member of this church or not? Really, it, I mean, it's on the verge of blasphemy, whether we like it or not. Um, being, you know, being a member of a church is important. It's not, right, I'm wearing this and saying it, is not the be-all and end-all of Christianity. Uh, the be-all and end-all of Christianity is the Christ energy and the Christ consciousness and our relationship to that. Um, and are we doing that? Just thoughts in the head, words and formulas. If that's all we've got, then we're not doing too well. Um, yeah, I'll pass back on that. What do you think of that one, John? Well, I mean, you can go back to the, the pre-Reformation, okay? What was the argument? The argument, see, it, it, Hus, Jan Hus, right? He, was, he predated uh, uh, Martin Luther. And his big contention with the church was because at the time uh, they would consecrate the wine and the bread and the priest would take the sip of the wine and but the uh, parishioners, all they got was the bread. They didn't get any of the wine. And that was his big argument. It's like, why are we leaving them out of, of the mystery of, of the wine into, into the blood? And I mean, it's hard for us to appreciate it, but he ended up being burned at the stake over that issue. 
and he said, you know, I, I've come, but I'm just, I'm just the goose. But and I forget how many years it, he he predicted uh, the swan will come, and you won't be able to stop him. And then, of course, as history tells us, the it was Martin Luther nailing his points on on the the door of the cathedral, right? And the the specific rubs that he had with church doctrine at the time and that was the official beginning of the uh, reformation and then you have the counter-reformation going on with the jesuits ultimately uh, determining what the outcome would be of that particular uh, treaty arrangement so you have all this stuff that's all this stuff operating out of the world of men right it's the it's it becomes a, a issues where you got hair splitting uh, with with this this whole idea of the words. What does it what does the word mean? Well, what is it? What is a comma? Is a comma a word? What about a semicolon? What what do they what do these things mean? I mean, I was used to be in music business and I get these contracts from Virgin Records and they didn't have any punctuation. It's like no. You think you're going to trick me with that one? It's like a punctuation mark in a contract could be more important than the word that's used. You know, it, it is a, a legal uh, entity that that particular, you know, whether it's comma or period or what have you. So it, does, it the devil is in the details, as they say. And so it, it becomes important that you have uh, a cosmology. And I think that that's the primary consideration that, that uh, spiritual science has to offer over and above other systems of knowledge because they seem to approach it from in terms of space. They don't have, they don't uh, equate a valuation to time. They don't have a morphology of history. And so they tend to transplant their way of looking at the world on ancient cultures and saying, thinking that well they they thought about it because it was yeah, they just made something up to cover something they couldn't explain or yeah you know, i mean it, it gets pretty ridiculous when you get into like studying like karnak's uh kind of humanist uh attempt to to uh he he was one of the most important people in the history of of new testament commentary but you look at the guy and you and and you see that the guy is like really stuck in his worldview he's one of, he's one of the original space beings he doesn't have any comprehension of time whatsoever and so what you end up with is like the that jesus ends up being transformed in like this really really nice guy who said some really great things, uh, which is exactly not how it's presented within spiritual science or Christian occultism. It's that Jesus Christ was an incarnation of the word. It's in the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John. I guess he didn't get the memo, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's okay, he can think like that. That's where he's at. He gets to do that. And that's that Luciferic mystery that it's because the if you get into understanding the the kind of a, a dualism so to speak of of the creation mystery you see that you have the divine spiritual beings and then you have the ideas that are put forth by these divine spiritual beings and that the the substantial nature of the retarded angels is that arising out of the ideas of the divine spiritual beings okay that so if you want to identify with the reflection in the mirror rather than the source of that existence well good on you but that's that's ultimately what's going on in the world today they want you to worship the reflection in the mirror and and that's this abject fallen materialism that ultimately is going to end up clinging to the cinder of earth as the physical earth drops away into the eighth sphere. And, you know, I, I can't tell you the level of pity that arises in you if you, if you begin to contemplate the destiny of the souls that 
don't succeed at, at, at developing as human beings according to the principles of spiritual science, that they don't get past the gatekeeper at the end of Earth evolution, that they have to take a different path than the, the, the representatives of mankind that succeeded at becoming fully human. And so that's, that's a challenge right there. Can you become fully human? You know, and you may work real hard this life and really blow it bad in your next one. So don't be so judgmental about what somebody else is doing. Why don't you worry about your own stuff? And that being said, I want to acknowledge this uh, recent publication by Daniela Hadi Erendus, that's uh, Reverend David's partner and, and editor. Uh, it's on the philosophy of education towards an anthroposophical view, and that's available uh, online. I have the link below, and you can even get a, a free uh, digital version of it. it and see if you want to have it. I, I prefer having books myself. And uh, But Reverend David here is a substantial author with another, uh, he's got another uh, another work coming out. Something's in the oven, I hear. And so I'm looking forward to it. And But to, in the meantime, he has three books. The first one is The Grammar of Witchcraft, which is a Shakespearean study. As I've Almost always say it's not a grimoire, it's not a book of magic spells, but it does have a magical quality because of his mastery of the English language. Now here we have his poetry and he also has a certain mastery of poetic language. This is Shakespearean as poetry. As we know, Caliban is a character drawn from Shakespeare and there's a, a picture that everybody says is David and he insists it isn't, and I, I haven't developed my opinion on it thus far. And here's his major work, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg, and the Arts. Uh, and it's edited by the aforementioned Daniela Hadi Irinduced. And uh, this is a, a marvelous book. It's so wonderfully written. I wish I could write as well as that. And they're available on Amazon. And uh, you should check them out. As for myself, I am the author of two books, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood, and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, The Underground Streams, a esoteric Christianity which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, with a forward by my best buddy from American Intelligence Media, Douglas Gabriel. It's got 640 pages, and it's full of uh, a full uh, bibliography and a tremendous number of diagrams that are derivative to a large extent from the handwritten diagrams across my desk from uh, Aaron Ford Pfeiffer, the founder of Biodynamic Gardening here in the U.S., and a direct... One of the young students that was with Rudolf Steiner so much. And, but this gives you the cosmological and Kabbalistic and uh, all these various correspondences pertaining to the mystery of time, which is what Christ has, has brought us to through the mystery of Pentecost. And, and this, these books are both available. This one, uh, as a forward by the noted astrosopher and psychologist, the late William Bento, and they're available on eBay from me directly in the continental US. And uh, if you're not in the US or you prefer taking a different route, you can contact me by private message through my academia link below. The forward by William Bento can be downloaded for free in a PDF format. And uh, you can also contact me through private message on Facebook. And, but I also, I, got, I created such a list of things that I want to remember to do, but I, I don't want to forget that this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla, Vadim, Vivian, Neil, Christian, Mark, Ma, Druvman, Laura, Paula, Rick, Michael, Beth, Ishtar, and so many others over the years. And I want to thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. And if you want to be supportive and buy us a cup of coffee, 
you can go to paypal.me forward slash d perry 777 for reverend david or for myself uh, paypal.me forward slash john barnwell 888 and don't forget to click like and subscribe and do all the things that are supposed to be a good thing to do on on uh, this uh, platform of uh, YouTube, and uh, we covered a lot of ground today. A lot to, a lot to concern ourselves with but that uh, I think are is worthwhile things to think about. And I want to get into uh, a further exploration between that whole challenge, the Pauline challenge, really, because it's it has to do with that, the way in which. The Old Testament culture converges into the in the world of of Greco Roman thought, and because it, it's through that that it became uh, considered to be a world religion rather than just a a small cult within Judaism. So that being said, as uh, we could now have our Reverend David uh, give us a, a prayer after I'm sure he has some some comments firebrand that he is and uh, i just got a text from tyler gabriel so she's so busy creating she's not watching at the moment i'm sure and that's a good thing she can check it out later so reverend david it's back to you well, a couple of things i mean i i strangely rather like isaac osimo but his naturalistic version of the bible is is really embarrassing for everybody so please just put that away and talk about robots. Um, secondly, sometimes the nature of the Greek gods is brought out best in pulp. There used to be a kids series, or was it a kids series called Hercules, with some muscle-bound young buck, and it had sort of famous actors playing the Olympians. They impressed me in one way. Um, he's having a beef with Hades at one point, or they're having trouble down there. And of course, Hades appears as young and beautiful because he's an Olympian. All the demonic stuff comes later because that's <laughs> mixed in with, with Christian and, and Judaic thoughts, not Greek thoughts. So, of course, as an Olympian, he would have been young and beautiful forever. That's what they were. Um, and there is a, a, a human side of seeing the Olympians, but there's a divine side, curiously. I mean, Plotinus is very clear when he's walking through Olympus, walking atop Olympus, that the celestial form of the gods is beyond human comprehension, effectively. And they are energies and forces and powers that simply can't be codified in that particular way. Um, and that's something I think we need to address further. I mean, this, this show is turning very, very clearly into the way of language, the language of the angels, which is anthroposophy. And how we begin to grapple with that and how we learn what that is and what it means to us and how it will transform us. I think that's very exciting. Um, prayer. Gosh, what can a crippled old priest say on a day like this? John. If you don't know the word, can you think the thought? Yes. Um, Helen, what was it? Helen Keller. Helen Keller. The, the, the nemesis of Wittgenstein. What is she talking about? But right, she, she, she had the experience you didn't. Right. Um, so, um, and we can talk about, we'll start with that one next week. That's a good one. Um, and remember, I'm, I'm a total admirer of Wittgenstein, but even he could drop the ball. Um, oh, my friends, isn't it wonderful that we've all had the opportunity to be together again for another Sunday discussion? Isn't it wonderful we're turning into a community of seekers and not simply people linked together by a, a, a chat show? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that our words are beginning to extend and evolve in our minds and our hearts as we search for the language of the angels that is the grammar of all things manifest? My friends, may that knowledge and that learning and that faith be in your days and in the week ahead and lead us all safely until we meet here again next week. May Christ be with you in every way, shape, and form. Amen. He is risen. Amen. Thank you once again, and thank you, everybody, for showing up and for those that 
catch this later on. Greetings to you also from the venerable Reverend David and myself, and we bid you adieu.